Nestled in North Georgia's Blue Ridge Mountains lies the small town of Elijay. With a population of only 2,500, this charming town has something for everyone. This region is an outdoor lover's paradise, welcoming visitors with wilderness cabins, hiking trails, lakes, fishing, wineries, apple orchards, and Bigfoot? We'll visit local offerings and attractions, reveal triumphs and tragedies, and explore the history of the region and LJ. Welcome to History Roads. Located about 70 miles north of Atlanta, Ella J lies to where the Cardike and Ella J rivers meet. After spending a few hours taking in the sights, visitors can quickly see why in 2018, Reader's Digest voted this small town as one of the nicest places to live in America. Located in the center of the town is a roundabout with a small park honoring the war veterans of Gilmer County. Behind the town's courthouse lies the city cemetery. Taking the winding road past graves dating back to the early 1800s, the top of the hill overlooks the skyline of downtown Elijay, with the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background. Downtown Elijay takes you back in time, where the pace is slower, the people are friendly, and the atmosphere welcomes you. Local restaurants and more than 30 shops offer specialty foods, art, and handcrafted items. Like many of the towns in northern Georgia, they are dog-friendly, and your furry friends are welcomed at many of the stores and restaurants. If you enjoy history, especially about the Civil War, a trip to the Tabor House Museum is a must. Built in 1870, it is the oldest home in Elijay. Plan to spend about an hour viewing rare artifacts, books, and photos, while helpful volunteers are there to answer any questions. Elijay was a hidden mountain community in northern Georgia until 1991 when the Zell Miller Mountain Parkway was built, allowing tourists better access to this mountain wilderness. To make the most of your visit to Elijay and the surrounding region, here are our top five activities to see and do. Number five, antiques. If you enjoy antique hunting, Ella J will not disappoint. Great bargains and local treasures can be found at multiple stores located downtown and throughout the area. With its rich southern heritage, diverse history and culture, it's quite possible you'll come across plenty of hard-to-find, unusual, and priceless pieces. Rummage through furniture, jewelry, artwork, clocks, toys, collectibles, and even a few artifacts from the Civil War. The stores are big and packed full of a wide variety of items, so be sure to allow for plenty of time. If you can't find what you're looking for, just ask. The friendly folks will steer you in the right direction. Number 4. Wilderness View Cabins Hundreds of rustic cabins surround LJ offering creekside access complete with outdoor fire pits, grills, fireplaces, and hot tubs to make your stay relaxing and memorable. Ideal for family reunions, corporate retreats, or just a getaway for the weekend, most cabins offer all of the necessary amenities, including heating and air conditioning, so you can be assured your visit will be comfortable in summer or winter. If you're fortunate enough to catch one of the winter snowfalls, the landscape turns into a winter wonderland. As you enjoy your stay, you will notice many cabins reflect a bear theme, and with good reason. About 4,000 black bears live in North Georgia. Nothing to worry about, however, as sightings are rare and they try to avoid human contact. Most cabins are also pet-friendly, so you can bring your four-legged friends to enjoy the wilderness with you and your family. 
Number 3. Wineries Need a break after a long day of hiking or antique shopping? Scattered around LJ are vineyards and award-winning wineries offering daily tastings, sampling a range of red and white wines from the region. While known for their apple orchards, the southern Appalachian soil is ideal for growing grapes as well. Many wineries are family-owned and they go out of their way to make you comfortable with owner-led tours, outdoor fireplaces, and amazing mountain views. Visit local tasting rooms and relax with friends and family, enjoying fine wine, snacks, cheese platters, and even live entertainment surrounded by the North Georgia mountains. Each year in March, the Wine Growers Association of Georgia sponsors its Wine Highway Week, a great way to experience and taste new wines of the region. Number 2. Heritage Orchards and Apple Festival Elegy is blessed with pristine rivers and rich soil, and Heritage Apple Orchards have made Elegy famous worldwide with the town known as the Apple Capital of Georgia. Since 1971, the Georgia Apple Festival opens for two weekends, offering fun for the entire family, with food, art, rides, crafts, shopping, and of course, apples of all varieties. Usually held early October after the apple harvest, plan to book your trip early as local hotels and cabins fill up quickly. The orchards produce over 30 apple varieties, including Ginger Gold, Gala, Red Delicious, Honey Crisp, and much more. Local farmers markets and specialty stores offer a variety of produce and local treats like freshly baked hot apple pies and cold apple cider. Like your apples really fresh? A few orchards are open to the public where you can pick apples by the bucket right off the tree. Georgia owes a lot to the northern apple orchards. In the early 1920s, Georgia's cotton crops were wiped out by the infamous boll weevil. The local orchards bolstered the state's economy during this crisis, saving many from going hungry. L.J. Orchards produce over 600,000 bushels of apples a year, so there is plenty to enjoy. And number one, recreation. L.J. is the ideal base camp for exploring the great outdoors, and North Georgia has some of the best nature trails for the entire family to enjoy, and a few offer a visitor center to help you plan out your next adventure. With over 100 miles of single track and no real off-season, this area has been declared Georgia's mountain biking capital. Surrounding rivers and lakes are well known for their fishing, including local charters that will help you find the perfect fishing spot. The nearby Chattahoochee Forest provides easy access to amazing trails, lakes, and lookout points. Just 20 minutes west of L.J., the Cahuta Overlook offers a breathtaking view of the surrounding mountains. Further west is the Fort Mountain State Park, named for an ancient 885-foot-long rock wall located at the peak of the mountain. Archaeologists believe it was constructed around 500 AD, and while the origin is still a mystery, local Cherokee legend claims the builders were a race of moon-eyed visitors with light skin and blue eyes, while another legend claims the wall was built by Madoc, a Welsh prince who made his way to America around 1170, hundreds of years before Columbus. Sailing from Ireland with ten ships, Madoc landed in Mobile, Alabama, and moved north to the Georgia mountains, building fortifications along the way. Prince Madoc returned to Ireland with great tales of his adventures and persuaded others to visit America. Years later, they sailed from Lundy Island but were never heard from again. Stepping out on the overlooked platform, visitors are greeted with a spectacular view of the valley below. Heading south, Carter's Lake is a 3,200-acre, 450-foot-deep man-made lake offering a wide range of outdoor activities. Amicalola Falls is only 22 miles southeast of L.J. and well worth the short drive. The magnificent 729-foot waterfall is the third highest east of the Mississippi River. If you and your family enjoy outdoor adventures, 
you will love LJ and the surrounding wilderness. The first signs of human civilization in North Georgia can be found at the Etowah Indian Mounds located in Cartersville, about 45 miles southwest of LJ. They were the ancestors of the Muscogee Creek tribe pushed out later by the Cherokee. In the early 1500s, Hernando de Soto led an expedition of 500 Spanish soldiers through the region looking for gold. For the next 200 years, the European settlers lived peacefully along with the Cree Confederacy and the Cherokee Nation, both part of what was known as the Five Civilized Tribes. It is believed the name Elije is an anglicized form of a Cherokee word, Ilatsi'i, meaning green earth, and was once a large Cherokee trading center. Traditionally, it was thought that both the Creek and Cherokee descended from Mississippian Native Americans, with the Creek first migrating from the Mississippi Valley into northern Georgia in the mid-1400s, and later the Cherokee Nation migrating from North Carolina to northeast Georgia in the 1700s. However, there is growing evidence, including recent DNA testing, that suggests that Celtic visitors came to America over a thousand years before Welsh pilgrims arrived on boats from Europe, which supports the Cherokee legend of the mysterious wall in Fort Mountain and Prince Madoc. Some accounts state Welsh settlers were stunned that the Cherokees spoke and understood Camric, the native Welsh language. Their towns and structures were similar and both tribes were a matrilineal society that traced a member's history through the mother's family. The Green Corn Festival was the most significant festival in the year for both tribes, with the Creek giving thanks for the new corn crop and the Cherokee for giving old wrongs and starting the new year with a clean slate. As European settlers moved into the region, the fates of the Creek and Cherokee tribes would be framed through war broken treaties, and betrayal. One of the most prominent figures in Ella Jay's history is the legendary Cherokee chief named Whitepath, with a community, road, and even a beer named after him. Born in a small cabin near Ella Jay in 1761, his Cherokee name was Nunahitsanuga, which translates as, I dwell on the peaceful path. However, his life would be quite different as he fought both wars and legislation most of his life for his deeply held beliefs. Described as a tall, good-looking Indian, White Path had a commanding appearance, was a skillful orator, and a strict follower of their traditional ways. White Path spoke out against ceding land to the European settlers, rejecting their ways, and objecting to the introduction of Christian missionaries into their lands. Today, on the side of a busy state route 515, a small stone marks the location of his cabin, which was relocated and can be visited in Gainesville, Georgia. Walking Stick was a contemporary of White Path and was highly regarded in LJ, serving as a diplomat between the Cherokee and the U.S. government. While sharing cultural similarities, the Creek and Cherokee had often been enemies and when the Creeks sided with the French in 1812, the U.S. solicited the aid of the Cherokee Nation to defeat the French and their allies. During the War of 1812, the Creek Nation split into several factions. One group, called Red Sticks, because they had raised the Red Stick of War, which were war clubs painted red, opposed the American expansion into Creek territory. White settlers were concerned, and for good reason. On August 1813, Red Stick warriors attacked U.S. Fort Mims near the mouth of the Alabama River. After several hours of brutal fighting, the defense collapsed, and an estimated 500 men, women, and children were killed or captured, with the Red Sticks taking over 250 scalps. The U.S. government response was quick and decisive. Two months later, 1,300 mounted Tennessee volunteers including Sam Houston, along with White Path and Walking Stick, joined General Andrew Jackson to fight the Creek Red Sticks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, Alabama. Despite the best efforts of the U.S. Army, the Creek held out against overwhelming forces. Even under constant bombardment of cannon and gunfire, the Creek defenses could not be breached. 
Suddenly, during the battle, a turkey gobble was heard, and the Cherokee war cry filled the air. <coughs> the Cherokee warriors had managed to swim the river and outflank their old enemies. The proud Creek warriors would give no quarter and ask for none in return. They were all killed in the bloody battle. While the Cherokee only lost 18, one was the son of Walking Stick. During the intense battle, the Cherokee were credited with saving the life of the future president. The Creek Red Sticks were forced to surrender in March 1814, and a few months later, ceded over 20 million acres of Creek land to the United States under the Treaty of Fort Jackson. The Red Stick War victory and forcing the signing of the Creek Treaty propelled General Jackson into the national spotlight and on to becoming the seventh president of the United States. Motivated by political aspirations, Jackson would soon turn against Chief White Path and the Cherokee Nation, forgetting their support for the U.S. Army. Years later, a Cherokee leader bitterly stated, If I had known then, I would have killed him myself that day at Horseshoe Bend. The Cherokee Nation was determined to thrive, and on November 12, 1825, they established their capital, New Echota, just 35 miles west of Elijay. This planned community adopted a lifestyle that emulated their non-Native American Georgian neighbors, including a Cherokee council house and a Supreme Court building. In 1827, missionary Reverend Samuel Warsher arrived in New Echota and, working with Cherokee leaders, established the Phoenix Printing Office, as well as the Cherokee Phoenix, the first Native American newspaper. However, the Cherokee Nation's achievements were in direct conflict with the state and federal officials who perceived the growing Cherokee Nation as a threat. In an effort to push the tribe out of Georgia, the state declared the Cherokee Nation illegal and passed several oppressive state laws targeting the Cherokee and their supporters. Instead of fighting for their land on the battlefield, Chief Whitepath and Warsher took their case to the Supreme Court. In a major victory, Chief Justice John Marshall ruled in favor of the Cherokee, stating the Cherokee Nation was a distinct community, occupying its own territory of which Georgia had no jurisdiction. The Cherokee Nation celebrated this decision and the preservation of their homeland, but President Jackson, White Path's old friend, wanted the removal of all Cherokee and refused to support the court's ruling, and in 1830, Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act. With the support of the U.S. government, Georgia divided the Cherokee land into counties and held a lottery, giving the lands to Georgia citizens. Settlers rushed in, forcing the Native Americans off of their land. Under pressure from the U.S. government, the Cherokee Nation had no recourse but to sign the Treaty of New Echota in 1835. Three years later, in 1838, 7,000 federal troops arrived into North Georgia and began the roundup of the Cherokee in preparation for the relocation west. 75-year-old Chief Whitepath, along with thousands of men, women, and children, prepared to leave their homeland for the thousand-mile march west to Oklahoma, known as the Trail of Tears. During the long journey, it is said that the people would sing Amazing Grace, using its inspiration to improve morale. The traditional Christian hymn had been translated into Cherokee, and the song has since become a sort of anthem for the Cherokee people. They endured a bitterly cold winter, with at least a fifth of the Cherokee population dying on the journey, including Chief Whitepath. The Creek tribe was also being pushed off their native land through forced treaties, scams by land speculators, outright theft by squatters, and finally their fate was sealed with the betrayal of one of their own. One of the prominent chiefs of the Creek tribe was William McIntosh, who was of mixed Creek and Scottish blood. The Creek considered their land to be sacred and communal. Selling Creek land without council consent was illegal and punishable by death. The U.S. government was eager to own the remaining millions of acres of creek land for white farmers to grow cotton and other valuable crops. Without the council's knowledge, in 1825, McIntosh signed the Treaty of Indian Springs, 
which sold the entirety of the creek land to the U.S. government for $200,000, while he and a few others pocketed the money. Creek retaliation was quick and severe. Eyewitnesses documented what occurred in a letter. For his betrayal, hundreds of Creek warriors came to his house late at night and set it on fire. His two wives managed to escape, but the chief stayed inside, exchanging gunfire. Finally wounded, the warriors rushed in and dragged McIntosh out of his house. In front of his wives, a warrior raised a sharp knife and plunged it into the heart of their traitor. What once was the largest and most powerful Native American tribes in the Southeast, the Creek Nation was facing starvation after being forced off their ancestry land and would eventually join the Cherokee Nation relocating west. In February 1861, Georgia was one of the original seven states that formed the Confederate States of America, the beginning of the U.S. Civil War. By that summer, the Union naval blockade had virtually shut down the export of cotton, as well as the import of manufactured goods. Georgia's governor pleaded with farmers to grow more food and less cotton. The farmers held out, hoping the shortage of cotton in Europe would hasten their intervention and break the blockade. Soon, food shortages were taking their toll, with poor white women raiding stores and capturing supply wagons for basic necessities. Ella J. and the surrounding northern Georgian towns were not plantation country and had few slaves. In fact, much of the northern area remained on the side of the Union, while the mountains and isolated terrain provided shelter and means of escape for deserters. The war was hard on those left behind, and the need to return home to help their starving families was often too great. A plaque along the Stanley Rapids tells of one such story. Elisha Stanley, his brother-in-law Evan Hughes, and Ed O'Kelly were conscripted into the Confederate Army, but went absent without leave to come home at the end of the summer to help their families. Like many farmers living in the mountains, they did not support the Confederates. Because they were AWOL, a troop was sent to bring them back, dead or alive. Elijah was living with his wife Jane and their children in a cabin next to a creek that now bears his name. He was fixing his son's shoe when the troops arrived, and without hesitation, they shot Stanley a total of six times. The troop next spotted the O'Kellys on the road returning from Gainesville. Ed O'Kelly ran up the hill while his brother jumped into the river and escaped. The troop moved quickly on horseback, cornering Ed, and shot him. Then the Confederates captured Evan Hughes while he was shearing a sheep at the edge of his cornfield. The troop took him to Shallowford, tied him to a tree, and killed him. Their bodies were buried at the Stanley Church of Christ, which also contains one of the most unusual markers in the cemetery. In the summer of 1915, Buell Stanley was fishing in nearby Toko River. Instead of a rod and hook, he was using dynamite. He accidentally blew off his arm, and it is buried with a marker, with Mr. Stanley later dying and buried at a different church. While a simple grave marker remembers another remarkable life of Moses Johnson, two brothers were returning from a trip to Atlanta during the Civil War, and when passing through the ruins of the Johnson plantation, they heard the sound of a baby crying. They picked up the black child and took him home to be raised by the Stanleys. He was the first African American to attend school in Fannin County, and his headstone simply reads, Mose Johnson, Colored. In downtown Ellijay, outside the Gilmer County Courthouse, a small plaque tells a story of the youngest soldier to fight in the Civil War. Born in Ella J. in 1851, David Bailey Freeman joined the 6th Georgia Cavalry on May 16, 1862, just two weeks after his 11th birthday, and with his mother's permission, went to Camp Felton, located near Cartersville, Georgia. Due to his small size and the pony he rode, David attracted a lot of attention riding through the small Georgia towns with his unit, and on occasion given presents by those who felt he ought to be home with his mother. After a cold winter, 
David became sick with exposure, his feet cracked and bleeding. He was discharged to home, but soon recovered, and at the age of 12, rejoined the 6th Georgia Cavalry. The Confederacy was desperate for soldiers, and David saw action through the spring of 1864 in the bloody battles to save Atlanta from Sherman's campaign. He was 14 years old when the war ended. After the war, David married, had three sons, and a long career in the newspaper business. He was considered largely responsible for reviving interest in annual reunions of Confederate veterans, earning the rank of general, and was even elected mayor of three towns. On June 18, 1929, at the age of 77, he died quietly and peacefully in Atlanta and is buried next to his beloved wife Kaylee in Cartersville, Georgia. There was still light out around 8.30 p.m. on May 20, 2019, when Edward Lee was driving along Highway 515 between LJ and Blue Ridge when something unusual caught his eye. He braked hard, skidding on gravel to a stop. What Edward described was a dark, 7-foot, 8-inch, hairy, two-legged creature with a pointed head and long arms, walking along the shoulder of the road and then into the woods. He waited on the back side of a small clearing, thinking the creature would emerge from the other side. It never did, but a man approached him and asked if he needed help. An astonished Edward blurted out, I just saw what looked like Bigfoot cross this patch of woods. The stranger just smiled and said, I believe you, and walked away. To support Edward's claim, there have been hundreds of sightings of what can only be described as Bigfoot or Sasquatch in the heavily forested North Georgia mountains. The furry guy has become a meme in the Blue Ridge Mountains and is featured in stores and shops in the surrounding area. Today, standing close to where Bigfoot was spotted, is the Expedition Bigfoot Sasquatch Museum. Owner David Becerra takes Bigfoot sightings seriously and has received reports of over 200 sightings since the museum opened. Visitors can view Bigfoot eyewitness sightings from all over the world, foot casts, testimonials, full-size replicas, and artistic renderings of sightings. When you next visit North Georgia, perhaps if you're in the right place and at the right time, you might be able to get a glimpse of the legendary creature. Beautiful mountains, crystal clear streams, fine dining, sportsmen's fishing, cozy wilderness cabins, world famous apple orchards, award winning vineyards and wineries, hiking trails, antique hunting, and even a reclusive resident called Bigfoot. Ella J is truly a jewel in the North Georgia mountains. The friendly folks at Ella J will ensure your visit will be treasured by you and your family. We'll see you next time on History Roads.